Okay, good evening. Welcome, welcome to this intimate gathering. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Bradley Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with, with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. Um, yeah, if, you, if you keep applauding, I'll never get through this intro, but thank you very much. But anyway, on behalf of uh, all our staff here, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. You know, this has really been quite an, an interesting uh, week for me. Uh, on Monday, I introduced uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, at a book event, and today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Katie Turr. Now, one thing these women, uh, these two women have in common is that they both know what it's like to get under Donald Trump's skin. <laughs> of course, I guess that could be said uh, about a number of women. Uh, but Hillary and Katie at least, Hillary and Katie at least have written books about the experience. And judging from the popularity of those books, People are very, very interested in what they have to say. I think the books are number one and number two yeah. on some, on some best, bestseller yeah. lists. Yeah. Uh, and let me tell you, you know, uh, wholesalers have sold out of them. Some bookstores have sold out of them. We have uh, uh, over 100 books here uh, tonight for, for, uh, for sale. So I, I hope you, you scoop, scoop, them, scoop them all up. The, the publisher uh, reached into some secret stash to send us about about 40 extra ones at the at the last minute, um, you know. Katie um, was um, uh, officially an, an NBC foreign correspondent based in London. When uh, while visiting the the U.S. in June 2015, uh, she was suddenly tapped to cover the Trump campaign, which had just been launched. Uh, she and her bosses all assumed it would be a short assignment. Um, <laughs> Instead, for Katie, it became a 17-month journalistic marathon across more than 40 states and involving uh, more than 3,800 live TV reports, all part of what Katie calls in her book, quote, the most unlikely, exciting, ugly, trying, and all-around bizarre campaign in American history. Uh, the book is titled Unbelievable, and Katie conveys with great detail, zest, pathos, and humor just how beyond belief the campaign was. As the Washington Post Review noted, what elevates Katie's story beyond uh, other campaign memoirs is her ability to capture the particular indignities of being a member of the press corps covering Trump, especially as a woman regularly demeaned by the candidate. Katie managed to maintain her professionalism throughout uh, and obviously has won lots of fans in the process. Uh, she notes at the end of the book that typically the lead reporter on a winning campaign ends up going to Washington to cover the White House, but Katie says she took herself out of consideration for that job because, among other considerations, she wanted a life. <laughs> instead, instead, these days, she has a plum position in New York as an anchor for MSNBC and a correspondent for NBC News. Now, Katie will be in conversation here this evening with uh, Jake Sherman, uh, he's a senior writer at Politico and co-author of the widely read morning newsletter Playbook. Uh, but get this, he, his firstborn was delivered at 3.30, 3.45 this morning. <laughs> Named Ryder. Nonetheless, Jake is here to be in conversation with Katie. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming both Katie and Jake. I feel like I should start by saying, wow, what a crowd. Look at the turnout. How about that? <laughs> I don't even get a working microphone. That's how, that's how important I am to this conversation. Hi, everybody. Hi. No. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I wonder if that reaction was like, wow, he's a horrible father. Or <laughs> I emailed him. I was like, what, what are you doing? Obviously, you're not coming tonight. He's like, no, I'll be on your show in about 20 minutes. So I did TV, and my <laughs> wife uh, encouraged me not to cancel. So uh, here we are. Yeah, right, right. You'll I'll, pay I'll, for I'll this. Pay, I'm, paying of, I'm paying it forward. I'm paying it forward. Um, we're going to get to the book in a second. I want to say one thing about Katie, who I've gotten to know uh, over the months and years. I appear frequently with Katie on TV. And the thing about Katie that is unique in the, you know, legions of reporters uh, uh, in Washington and TV personalities and TV journalists is 
Katie is really a reporter's reporter in that she is always pressing both uh, government officials and reporters and journalists to go beyond the uh, uh, the surface, which I have trouble with sometimes. So I, 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 she makes me feel uncomfortable. No, but she <laughs> she makes us uh, uh, dig in, and I think a lot of that has to do with that she's not part of our bubble here in Washington, and she wants to um, uh, she wants everyone to understand what's actually going on. So I appreciate that. I, I think you do just fine. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, half the time I don't understand what you're saying. Well, that. <laughs> That's a real vote of confidence. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the book. Uh, uh, it's, an, it's an intensely personal book, right? And I think that's, uh, there haven't been many campaign memoirs that were uh, intensely personal. So talk about both the process. I mean, you're going through this campaign in real time, reporting on a daily basis and on the side kind of pouring your heart out. Talk to, talk to us about that. In the moment, it felt like a good idea. Um, <laughs> and uh, now it does, too. A bestseller this week. <laughs> the question I got on the campaign trail most was, what is it like? What is it like to be on the road all the time? What is it like to uh, work at a network? What is it like to do an uh, MSNBC live shot every hour on the hour until eternity? Um, and, and what is the campaign like? Not only what is Donald Trump like, but what is his what is his staff like? And I felt at the end of the campaign that it was just such an incredibly wild and, and app title, unbelievable ride, that it was important to put it on on, on paper and and to make it fun for for me to write and I and I hope for you to read. I, I made it personal. I made it something that you can relate to or you can understand. You can get to know what the reporter is like behind the scenes. I think part of the problem that the media ha is having nowadays is people don't really know us any longer. I mean, maybe they never really did, but there's more of an expectation uh, that you should understand uh, where we come from and our process and how we um, get to what we report on television and what we put on paper. And hopefully this shares a bit of that but talk about that so i want to i want to we want to understand uh i'm speaking on behalf of the group that um talk about that process i mean at, you write in the book you had an excellent magazine story uh that talked about some of your being targeted by trump folks on the trail at that point you decided to write a book but talk about what that was like i mean are you going back to your hotel room at night and journaling how does that what does that look like uh, oftentimes when I get back to the hotel room I couldn't do anything more than um, turn on a, a cartoon like South Park <laughs> or Bojack Horseman or, or anything dumb and mindless and then just zone out and pass out um, I would find time to to write down all my notes um, either in the moment they were happening or a lot of the times uh, on a plane as I was flying uh, to my next location. We were on a plane almost every single day. Um, and I would jot, I would send myself little notes here and there throughout the campaign just to remind myself what was going on in the moment. I had a whole separate email account uh, that I oh, created just for the book. So that way I wasn't getting it confused with all the emails I was getting every other day or every day. I'm writing a book, um, I should probably do that. That sounds like a really good idea. Set yourself up a <laughs> Gmail account and, or whatever and then just send yourself notes. Um, uh, there was that and then there was also, I mean we had, as I'm sure you do at Politico, we have a, an internal DL where you share reporting, uh, you share your observations. A lot of this stuff can just be color of the scene that won't make it anywhere but can just give you a better context for how to report. So I used a lot of that, the stuff that I wasn't able uh, to get out there during the campaign because it just moved so fast and maybe it wasn't uh, relevant at the time, and I wanted to put that um, down on paper. So what you get is these, hopefully, these very um, vivid uh, uh, pictures of important moments during the campaign. Uh, what was it like when Donald Trump was um, saying that he, uh, Russia should hack into Hillary Clinton's email? and then telling me to shush. What was it like um, when Donald Trump, that first interview I did, uh, what was he like in the begin beginning of his campaign? What was he expecting? What was the room like? How was he behaving? Uh, what was it like at a TV network trying to figure out, what do we do with this, this wild 29 minute interview? Do we cut it down? No, let's play it all. Um, I wanna talk about that for a second, especially that, that interview specifically. Um, you came back, you were a correspondent in London and you came back. I don't want to give up too much of the book, which you should all buy. Um, uh, but 
you come back and you get an interview with Trump. And one thing that's striking to me, and it's been striking to a lot of reporters about Trump and about his, his aides, uh, is their reaction to the, to the media. Are Trump's, A, is Trump's outrage toward press genuine? Does he genuinely disdain the media? Or, and do his aid, are his aides, ca- uh, are, do they disdain the media too? Or are they you know, carrying out what he... Yes and no. I think some of it, his aides do genuinely disdain the media. I don't think Steve Bannon likes us all that much. Um, pretty sure Corey Lewandowski doesn't like us all that much either. Uh, he's not there any longer, but he was during the campaign. Um, I think Trump, Trump likes the press in as much as we give him attention and he feeds off attention. And he likes, the, he likes being um, the person that everybody is talking about. But he does feel like he is... treated and covered unfairly so it gets he gets angry about it so he will go back and forth like he'll want to be your friend but he'll also expect that your friend is only going to say nice things about you and he doesn't he didn't really understand that it's not a journalist's job uh to be friends with a candidate (laughs) but but it's funny what's always striking to us is that at the same time he uh uh disdains the New York Times. He talks to the New York Times all the time. But it, it, and and it, it, at the same time, he claims to disdain you and think you're unfair. He talks about you publicly and then talks to, calls you or uh, uh, gives you interviews. But it bestows a certain... Um, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? I a don't certain know. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Um, uh, it, 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 gives him, it gives him authority. It gives him a certain status. That's the word I'm looking for, status. Uh, the New York Times is the, I'm sorry, the Washington Post, the preeminent paper um, in the country. I, I think the Washington Post is amazing, but the, just the reputation of the New York Times. And she's not talking and about Politico just because I'm here, and I get that. It's cool. <laughs> Of course, obviously, <laughs> present company excluded. Um, but the, Donald Trump is from the, from New York. He l- grew up in New York. He lived in New York. New York, w- the New York Times, was the paper of record. It's what you read. If you're in the New York Times, you you are uh, deserving of it. You are of a heightened social class. And he always wanted to be a part of that. Maggie Haberman, and and she says this comes from, you know, a a, a storied New York family. And she's a political alum. And she's a Politico <laughs> alum, and she's, she's known on the political scene. So if Maggie Haberman is taking his candidacy seriously or his presidency seriously, that means he must actually be worthy of that attention. Let's talk about some of the uh, hatred spewed at you during this campaign. I think there was one reaction that was stunning to me, uh, and I'll read it out loud. You, this was a, a, an, a particularly bad episode. And your mom called you and said, are you okay? Where are you staying? Can someone stay with you? You need security. And you kind of realize that at that point you're a target. Take us inside your mind and inside what was going on uh, at these rallies where you were just just a main target of not only the, the Republican nominee, but... His his fa- his crowd. This was early on, but it wasn't the first time that he he had called me out in front of a rally. Um, the first rally I ever went to was on June thirtieth of twenty fifteen, and it was around a backyard pool. A couple hundred people were there. It wasn't like the Trump rallies that we ended up seeing later on um, in the campaign. And he was giving his his u- usual speech. He was um, talking about uh, his comments about Mexicans. Mexico sending rapists over the border. He was defending that. Uh, He was saying that he always gets standing ovations. And then he was going after the media. And in that process, he called me out by name, said I wasn't paying attention to him. (laughs) Seriously, he said that. And that's how it, and that's how the relationship began. And it's frankly how it ended. Um, (laughs) Where he would, he would call me out from a crowd to, to, to point me out to try and either charm me or bully me or uh, intimidate me into uh, more favorable coverage, and I wouldn't, and then he would go back and forth between charming and bullying, charming and bullying. And at that point, he was very upset because of a tweet that I had sent. And that it's illuminating to see how much, how closely they were paying attention to our coverage. Not entirely, n- they weren't paying such close attention, I think, to the daily live shots, but they were very much monitoring social media. And I sent a tweet a couple of days before about a rally in Raleigh, North Carolina. Say that, a rally in Raleigh. (laughs) Um, And this was the first time that protesters started to get coordinated. And there were 10 separate groups of protesters and they 
tried to interrupt Donald Trump every five or seven minutes or so. And so he never could really get on his game for his speech. He never found a flow. He also was dealing with what we learned later was a little bit of laryngitis, so he was sick. And when the 10th protester interrupted him, he abruptly stopped his speech for him. It was not like his usual speeches and uh, walked away from the mic. And I tweeted about it. Rachel Maddow picked it up a little bit later and the campaign was furious. They didn't like this idea that protesters would force Donald Trump from the stage. Um, and they took issue with the word abruptly. And I took issue with their taking issue because at that point I'd been to more dump Trump rallies than I could count. And I knew how he ends a rally with a crescendo towards let's make America great again. This did not happen. Um, and uh, I got an email from Hope Hicks the next day saying, Mr. Trump found your tweet to be disgraceful. <laughs> not nice, exclamation point. I remember. I, re I, rem I took a note of that. It's, it got so it got so bad for you that NBC assigned you uh, security. Yeah, so after that, you know, he tweeted me and my, my, my um, phone was full of um, vitriol and angry uh, Trump supporters. Um, and then he called me out the, at the Muslim ban day. And it was a scary time. I remember this time in, in, in the country, it was December 2015. Uh, two people in San Bernardino, a married couple, had just shot up an office party. People were scared. The president, President Obama, came out and gave a speech on terrorism. Donald Trump came out the very next day and announced that he was going to, his solution was to ban all Muslims. He said that the folks who were doing the vetting coming into the country were not vetting correctly and that there were Muslims in your neighborhood that were building bombs in their living room and their Muslim friends weren't reporting them and this is happening, it is putting your lives in danger. The media is complicit in this because they're not reporting on it. So this crowd that went to see him in South Carolina, we wondered how they would react. I mean, this is a ban on an entire religion. Are you going to, uh, is this a bridge to, is this a, a bridge too far? Is this, is this the point where Donald Trump is going to lose his support? We couldn't find a single person who thought it was a bad idea. One woman said, I have to think about it more. The rest had some var variation of, I think he's trying to keep us safe. Or one veteran said, I think it's shameful and a disgrace or a slap in the face to all my veteran uh, colleagues, my veteran friends who fought in Iraq or Afghanistan to have any Muslim in this country. We should ship them all back. So the crowd was angry and they were scared. And Donald Trump takes the stage and he's, he's heavier than usual, his tone is heavier than usual, it's a more serious night than usual. And he takes his time getting into the Muslim ban, getting into the announcement which everybody is waiting for. We're packed into the belly of a, of a World War II warship, packed in there. And the press, and we would travel around with him. The press is in this pen, and I'm sure you guys have seen pictures of it. Bicycle racks would surround us. And this one was, was particularly tight, particularly small, because the venue was small. And we were pressed up against a corner, but the supporters were on all other, all three sides of us. There was really no way out, um, even if you were trying to get out. And I'm sitting on the riser, because I just feel like it's one of those nights where you don't really want to make a, make yourself be known. Yeah, I just I just felt like it was good to lay low. He had tweeted me, I was feel already feeling a little uneasy. I'm going to lay low tonight. And I hear my name. Like the first rally. Katie Turr, she's back there, little Katie, third rate dishonest reporter. God, I know I it. I know it by rate. heart. <laughs> um, thanks. You're going to be a good dad. Um, and The entire place turns around and they boo, and it's loud, and it's weird. It's just like, I can't ex describe the feeling when, in, when it's like at this room, all of you just started booing and hissing Don't, in an angry way. It, it's, it's, it's weird. 
Um, and it, but it had happened to me before. So I, I, I learned whenever Donald Trump was angry or he pointed me out or he tried to turn the crowd against me, if I smiled and waved at people, it would diffuse the situation because if they felt like I was playing along or I was in, wasn't intimidated, then they wouldn't go as far as maybe they would uh, if they thought that I was scared. Um, and so I smiled and I waved. And then I got up and I did my job. He announced the Muslim ban. I did a couple live shots. And I mean, I'm tense and my phone's buzzing. I'm trying to just get through it. And when I was done, a, a Trump staffer shooed away the stragglers who had been waiting to, to get behind me and yell or who knows what. And he said, these guys are gonna walk you out. And it was a couple of secret service agents. And I remember thinking, oh my God. But I, the first thought was, thank God they're walking me to my car. There is a, th we're walking down a gangway, 500 yard gangway, pitch black, to my car, which is, it's me and Anthony, my producer, to, um, to our car that's parked with all the other supporters. And I got in the car and my mom's calling and my, and my bosses are calling and my phone is, my, my Twitter is going crazy. I'm getting text messages. My friends are horrified. A and I, I know my heart's beating really fast. And I think, you know, we can't go back to the hotel immedi immediately because what if someone follows us back there? So we went to dinner. And then we hoped that in the, in the time period it took us to, to eat a meal, um, things will have calmed down. But that night going to bed, it was, it was a difficult, it was difficult. It was nerve wracking. Must have made it more difficult for you to do your job too, because if you're being trailed around by private security guards, like you describe in the book, um, it's tough to get out and interview people. It is, I mean, I like to talk to people. I, I, liked, I like walking up to anybody that I, I might see at any rally, wherever m I might be, and just asking them a question without trying to, without feeling like maybe I need to watch my back. And it's weird to have a security guard there when somebody would, would would walk up to the to the bike racks at Trump Tower. Um, the security guard would would try to stop them and move them away. And I, and that, that's I'm a reporter. Like I'm not a. I mean, thank you guys for coming, but I'm not a celebrity. I'm not like I'm no one that actually needs or this needs to be protected otherwise. or deserves that. I mean, it, this is I just want to I want to talk to you. That's what I do for a living. And so that was weird and uncomfortable. But mostly, you know, I I'm good at compartmentalizing, so I just ignored it. One of the, and we have, a t I, I'm sure there are a few questions in here, um, uh, so um, we'll get to them. I'm, I'm only going to ask a couple more questions. Uh, thank you. No, one of the, uh, thanks. One of the challenging points of the campaign for Trump was the Access Hollywood video, where you were put in a, uh, an extremely strange position. Talk about that and talk about the position you were in with NBC, who aired Access Hollywood. I kind of want to read that email that I sent. Oh, yeah, it's probably demarcated. Let's see. Let's see if we can find it. Um, I took you copious actually took notes, notes in this thing. I love on it. Katie's book. Uh, so access Hollywood. Oh, here it is. Found it. Look at that. Um, this is October seventh. And you remember the access Hollywood video? Yeah, yeah. you don't okay. need to describe it. Everyone remembers. I just, you know, I don't take anything for chance, so uh, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the newsroom at, at, at 30 Rock. We happen to be back in New York for a day. I'm not in nightly news that day. I have a couple more hits. It's going to be a relatively easy day, we think. Um, and I get a call from one of my bosses and one of the executives. And I have a guilty conscience, so I thought, oh, my God, what did I do? <laughs> and she's like, oh, you're fine. Come in. I, I have something to show you. And I get into her office, and she is on the phone in what appears to be a very serious phone call. And she points to her computer and she just says, play that. And it's a video, so I press play. And uh, it's a, I don't know what it is, it's a, it's a Access Hollywood bus and two disembodied voices that I can barely hear, so I gotta press my, my ear up to the computer. And I quickly realize it's Donald Trump. I mean, it's the same voice I've been hearing in my head for <laughs> 490 days. Um, and he's saying pretty wild stuff. I talking about how he we did try to to, <laughs> to do this and that, and yes, she was married and she had great whatever or or fake whatever, and and he tried uh, to win her over by taking her furniture shopping was one of the yeah, <laughs> which is no one's ever tried that on me. I I've never tried that on anyone else. <laughs> I don't particularly like furniture shopping, so. No, who does? It's no, terribly it's boring. Yeah, but anyway. 
I do need to get a bed frame. <laughs> Tony, where are you? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, so I, I hear this, and I remember hearing, you know, you can, I can, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything, grab them, buy them. The word. Um, and yeah. I, I screamed. I was, I just screamed that. Did Donald Trump just say you can grab them by the, and I said the word. La I mean, I'm in the executive row of NBC. I yelled this at the top of my lungs. I forgot where I was. And my boss was like, yeah, yeah we need you to put that on television. <laughs> I remember thinking, how in the world do I, do, do I describe this? And are we going to play it? Are we bleeping it? And, and how do I say that? Like, what, what euphemism do you use for that? How do I make this NC-17 language into PG? <laughs> More cable, PG, <laughs> Key, PG language. Um, oh, and by the way, you need to send an email to the campaign and get a comment. <laughs> so what ensued was the weirdest email I have ever had to write. Hope and Jason, Hope Hicks and Jason Miller. NBC News has obtained a video of Mr. Trump during an interview with Access Hollywood from 10 years ago. Mr. Trump is on a hot mic having a conversation with Billy Bush bragging about hitting on a married woman. I did try and, I'll censor this, F her, she was married. He also talks about how he behaves with women he is attracted to. He says, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the P. The v but I use the actual word. The video is from 2005. The Washington Post is dropping this in about an hour. We will be following suit. Does the campaign have a response or context? Thank you very much, Katie Turk. <laughs> I never got a response. I didn't think so. <laughs> So I, 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 I quickly, I wrote a script, and um, I, I uh, figured Sen out how to say it. Some I censored some things. I, I said, you know, sexual advances uh, in, for grabbing peas, which is, which is not fair to sexual advances, <laughs> let's be honest. And I went on air, and I, and I said this, and it was, I mean, it, it, I, we're laughing about it now, but it, 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 it is deadly serious. It was deadly serious at the time. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room has been sexually assaulted. I know people who have, and it's not funny. It's not something to joke about, and it's not something that um, that <laughs> I ever thought a presidential candidate would be bragging about. So we go on the air, and, and we do the story, and the campaign goes completely silent. I mean silent. Kellyanne Conway cancels her appearances on television that weekend. Kellyanne Conway <laughs> canceled her appearances on television. Um, uh, we couldn't get a comment from anybody. We didn't know whether, there was talk that Donald Trump would drop out. There's no way Donald Trump's gonna drop out. He's not a quitter, um, or so he says. And so we just waited. We waited the whole day to see how, what was the reaction. And Republicans, if you remember this, Jake, and you'll remember this better than I do, Republicans were silent for a while. They didn't know what to do. And you know it actually, uh, the one Republican who, the first Republican out of the gate was Tom Rooney from Florida who said, I couldn't be a good father. I couldn't consider myself a good father if I support somebody who says this, which. And Mike Lee gave that, that very emotional Facebook message yeah. to his supporters. Paul Ryan canceled an appearance. It was the first time Paul Ryan was going to appear with Donald Trump, a do a campaign event. It was sort of pseudo campaign event. No, it was a, it was a fair. It was the f his annual fall fair in, in Wisconsin. He canceled it, disinvited Donald Trump from it. Fifty Republican lawmakers, former and current, said that they were not going to vote for him or demanded that he drop out of the race. It looked like the end. I would note that a lot of those Republicans that said that they couldn't stomach this and and couldn't look their children in the eye are now supporting him in his presidency it's a weird thing about politics um i guess memories are short so we were waiting to find out what was going to happen um donald trump releases a statement that night and it's on facebook and he seems angry he seems like he's under duress uh he he apologizes for his bad language, calls it, dismisses it as locker room talk, but says that's just it. It is just talk. Look at what Bill Clinton has done. And look at what Hillary Clinton has done to those who have accused her husband. 
And that was a good indication of how that debate would go off uh, the next day. Remember, there was a debate the next day in St. Louis, and that's when they brought out all of uh, Clinton's accusers. So it, this felt like, at the time, it felt like if anything was going to do Donald Trump in, it was going to be that. But then we s went to rallies, and there were still thousands and thousands of people showing up. They were still packed. They'd still wait hours. There was a woman who showed up to a rally, and Ben Jacobs took a picture of her. God bless Ben Jacobs. Of the it, Guardian. Of the Guardian, the one who was... He was beat, later slammed. beat up by the yeah. now congressman from Montana. Which is terrible because he's actually a really funny guy and a great reporter, so he shouldn't be known for that. He shouldn't be beat up by congressman either. But well, there's... <laughs> You know, you know he's not, he's reneged on his... I know that, yeah. He reneged on the interview that he was promised, that Ben, he promised Ben Jacobs after he promised, uh, or after he apologized for physically assaulting him. Awful. It is awful. What is surprise, let's, let me, let's move on from the Access Hollywood thing for a second, and, and what has surprised you the most about, having covered Donald Trump for so long, about his presidency? Nothing. <laughs> No, I'm serious, and, I, and th it's funny, but it, nothing. He is exactly who he is, um, and, and for better or worse. I mean, there's a lot of people in the country um, who look at that and they say, you know what, finally somebody's coming in here and they're not going to apologize, and they're going to force Congress to work together, and he's not going to be loyal to the Republicans, he's not going to be loyal to the Democrats, he's going to be loyal to what he thinks is right, he's going to try and make them work together. There are a lot of people who voted for him who really just wanted that to happen. They understood that he was a flawed person, they didn't care, they just wanted somebody to go and shake things up, and I understand that. As, a, as somebody who, who has been watching this um, from afar for my, from, my, from my entire life, I lived in California, I lived in New York, I moved to London, I was not involved in politics, I remember dismissing it and saying, what a terrible place Washington is. I, and not, not in a derogatory way towards any of you, but why, why? <laughs> you have to remember you're in Washington now. <laughs> when, I mean, when I say Washington, I mean Congress. Um, <laughs> We'll forgive you. Washington's a lovely place, and I really like it here. Um, <laughs> no, but, I, but you, why can't anybody get along? I mean, I, I just got so tired of the, well, the Democrats are voting this way, so that's how they're going to vote. The Republicans are voting this way, and that's how they're going to vote. H how are you, healthcare is something that should be bipartisan. We talked about this on TV We today. talked about this, on, and y I always get so, so um, exasperated over it. It should be bipartisan. It shouldn't just be the Democrats. It shouldn't just be the Republicans. It should be bipartisan because it should be something that lasts. It shouldn't be something that the next party comes in and tries to tear out and do over again every four to eight years. Um, so I understood, and I, and I empathize with Donald Trump's supporters. I understood the frustration. Um, and I understand why some of them, many of them, will look at him right now and not, and not find there to be much wrong with what he's done in his presidency. They will say, and they'll believe this sincerely, and I, and I, I get it, that the establishment, Washington, the swamp, is not there to make sure that Donald Trump is successful. They're, to make sure, they're there to make sure Donald Trump fails because they want to protect their own special interests. They don't, they're not trying to protect us, the American public who voted for him. They're trying to protect their, their jobs, their, their pocketbook, anything but the interests of the American people. And you have to, you can't, I mean, I don't know who supports who in this room, but if, if you want to paint a broad brush for of Donald Trump supporters, I think you're doing yourself a disservice and you're deluding yourself. They're not all racist or xenophobes or dumb or uneducated. I mean, it's a wide swath of people who were just frankly angry and felt like they weren't being heard. A and to say and to dismiss them and say they're all crazy and they're never going to vote again or don't worry, next time we're going to get all of the voters, that they'll know better when they go to the voting booth it is wrong. It's better to understand where somebody's coming from and understand why they made a choice that you may not understand at all, rather than dismiss them. It gets, gets you down the same rabbit hole all over again. Will he run again? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know if he's actually going to put his hat. And, and, I, and I talk to people who know him really well, and there is, that is an open question, uh, whether or not he's going to want. I, I will say this. He loves campaigning. He loves it. I think he likes it more than being the president. <laughs> I, I, don't, I just don't know. Uh, and we and we have to turn to questions soon because we're eating. Up, I'm eating up all the time here. But uh, you talk a lot about the culture on the campaign trail, which is a 
a, a, a fascinating culture, both with journalists and, and operatives and the camaraderie that you build, even w among journalists, but with people that you have to interact with from the campaign. Uh, would you do this again? I, yes, I would. I mean, it's it's a weird. Tony, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, my my fiance is here, and I think he was not going to like that. Idea. <laughs> um, it's but it is it's um it's a weird addiction you get uh, to being on the campaign trail. It, it it's awful. I mean, you live out of a suitcase for a year and a half. You eat out of gas stations, and you don't sleep. And your bosses are trying off, like every moment they want a new piece of source reporting that doesn't exist. Um, and it's stressful, and it and and you don't see your families. You have to put your life on hold. But I, I, I do kind of miss it. It's like it's like being in college. You you're you're in a traveling dormitory. With that, um, <laughs> I, we're gonna th we have microphones on either side of the room. Um, so if you want to ask a question, line up, send a non-threatening hand signal, and. Uh, uh, but you, got, you have to come up to the microphones, I think. There's uh, one over here. There's one on, on each side. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you for coming. It's a thrilling uh, experience that you've described. Would you comment about um, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump on the campaign trail and and what they're doing now, please? Well, they, they weren't on the, they were he on the campaign trail here and there. When Jared was there, he was often behind the scenes and we wouldn't see him. Um, uh, they were, Ivanka came out after the Access Hollywood tape much more than she did before to try and soften her father's image. Uh, there is this idea that they are the, um, will be the, the great moderators of, of the president. I think that there's very little evidence to support that. Um, I think their dad works from the gut and he does what he wants to do. I will say this, they did try very hard to get Corey Lewandowski fired for a long time, and it took them it took them months and months, even after he was arrested for grabbing Michelle Fields. So I mean, how far does their influence go? I, I just don't know. And would you comment about uh, Melania Trump as well? She was always very nice. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Katie, I'm, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, but also some good news. The bad news is, once again, you're going to need the Secret Service to get you through a crowd. <laughs> the good news is, everybody here, I'm sure, including myself, wants to shake your hand and thank you for the incredible, <laughs> incredible job of reporting. Thank you very much. The, the job you did, and the most horrible job I could imagine for a reporter, thank you so much. And no matter what the New York Times says, I think you look plenty tough. <laughs> <laughs> she is. I can Poor attest to that. Writer. Thank you very much. Yes. Sir. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? Good. A little nervous, which is why I have this on. It says, I love it. Keep, Keep calm, calm and stutter, stutter on. on. Thank you. Uh, my question is, th there has, there has always been, been talk, and maybe it's not been addressed that that all of the major networks have a slant that they lean left or right, and if you ask them, you know, on the on the record it'll be like you know you know oh no that's not true we're you know mainstream have you ever encountered any situations where you believe that that is true or not? I think that um, that's obviously a tough question. I, I, I and one that you knew you'd get. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I I know that the prime time, excuse me, the prime time hours of the cable networks have their own slants. Um, of all the cable networks, maybe less so. See, oh, of all the cable networks, um, and. Uh, other net, you know, MSNBC is known for being liberal. Fox is known for being conservative. Um, I, I, I understand why those perceptions might be there. I think what we have done, 
and I can only speak for, for me and for my colleagues at MSNBC and NBC News, is we, I think we t tried to really reset in 2016 and um, uh, stick down to the middle when it came to covering this presidential election. Um, but I think that's a totally fair question. Thanks for asking it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is, don't you believe in your heart of hearts that through the campaign, despite everything he said and all the rallies, that he did not want to win and that his, that his, his most hoped-for outcome was to win the popular vote, lose the electoral vote. He can go back to his business and he can say he was cheated. And now that he's president, if it weren't for the investigations and the fact that he might have to pardon somebody, he, he would try to find a way to declare victory and leave. Uh, I think you're referring to that famous line in The Candidate. Wh what is it? What now? What do we do right. now <laughs> after you win? Um, Robert Redford, yeah. Uh, I I'm not in Donald Trump's head, so I, I can't guess to what he is thinking. Um, the epilogue of my book addresses just what you are talking about, whether or not he did want to win and the evidence that there is um, to support whether he's enjoying himself uh, <laughs> in the presidency. I don't know... I you know, and again, I'm not him. I don't know if it's um, fair to say that he's only there because he, because he might need to pardon someone. I'm not sure about that. But again, I'm not in his head. I'm sorry. Fair enough. Yes. Hi. Uh, I want to tell you first how much I admire you. Sorry. Uh, I'm eager to hear about the kiss. About <laughs> no, no, about how, y how you felt about it at the time, and did you want to kick him <laughs> where you should have? Or, I but I know you couldn't have done that and gotten away with it, so please tell us. Oh, I, I don't ever want to assault anybody. I know. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, listen, it, 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 I wouldn't, I, it was just inappropriate for the setting. Oh. It was well, inappropriate for the setting. Ma perhaps any setting. Well, I mean, I, I would go up to you, Jake Sherman, and kiss you on the cheek, vice versa. I think that's fine. Well, we're not colleagues. A, we're not presidential candidates. You're not a presidential <laughs> right. candidate. We're colleagues. A kiss on the cheek is a is a most of the time a very innocuous thing, and it's a gesture, and it's and it's just a greeting. Um, it, it's just inappropriate in that setting because he is a presidential candidate, and I was a reporter. And in the moment, I'm a reporter who's fighting for credibility on a beat that I. I was only partially in charge of at the time. I'm not a political reporter. I've got to, I'm covering this guy who's getting all of this attention. I ne need to be seen as somebody who has the authority over this, that I am fair, that I am balanced, that I am not biased in any way, or my reporting isn't being uh, colored because Donald Trump is being nice to me. So in that moment, I mostly felt nobody is going to take me seriously because how, of this. How about the fact that he's a creep? <laughs> Seriously, did that ever enter into your thought? I, I again, it was nobody's going to take me seriously, and that and that is an honest answer. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you very much. Hi, um, thank you so much. I expected uh, a lot from this, and I got even more. So Great. thank you very very much. Um, I, I have a. Uh, narrow question on the political impact of Hillary Clinton's deplorable statement. You were there both before and after. It's always seemed it to was me bad. like it was a turning point. In, in it and gave you spoke about the broad uh, characteristics of uh, Trump supporters, and it seemed to me that that might have reached a fairly broad hunk of those supporters. And, it, it gave them a rallying and, cry. Mm, right. It gave them a, a, you know, a way to push back. You think we're deplorable? We're going to own this word, and we're going to use it against you. What, was it a turning point? I, I think I'm not. I think it helped start to turn things. I mean, I, the, his supporters were there, regardless. I think what it did was it it made her look more out of touch uh, with a segment of the population she needed to win over. Um, you know, white working class voters in places like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Right, right. Um, and it, it, I think it underscored what some people wanted to believe about her, that she right. didn't like 
the average voter and that she wasn't a champion of theirs. So it didn't help. It didn't help. I, 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 I think the, the election was, the momentum was all on Trump's side from very early on. I, I don't know if any one thing uh, turned it or put him over. I, Russia obviously is a question mark. Um, but I, I, even without all those, I, I think he was moving towards the Oval Office much more so than, than um, the polls at the time may have suggested. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, I just want to say it is such an amazing honor. Um, I, uh, I'm from Massachusetts, and I worked for a local newspaper, and uh, we would go up to the New Hampshire primary, my friend and I. We always really wanted to see you, and we never got the chance to. So it's so nice to see you. Uh, Mr. Sherman, it's also nice to see you, yeah. too. Um, <laughs> I'm used to this. Don't worry about it. Uh, my, <laughs> my, um, my, my question is, in the book, um, you talk a lot about feeling like uh, you didn't fit in. You're the outsider covering the outsider. Um, how do you want to be remembered? Um, do you want to be remembered just as somebody who covered Donald Trump? Um, or do you want to be remembered uh, m for more than just that? Because I think you get on that in your book, but I'm just curious to hear what you think. Uh, of course I'd like to be remembered for more than just that. I don't <laughs> think about that, though, because that's an incredible amount of pressure to put on myself. I have no idea uh, what I'm going to do next. I have no idea what curveball life might throw at me. I didn't ha I'm not somebody who makes a five-year plan or, or any of that. I, I just kind of go... Um, I go with the flow. You mean you didn't? I move surrender to, to the to flow. Only come back. You surrender to <laughs> the flow. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, there was a fish quote in there yeah. for anyone who might have <laughs> caught that. Um, yeah, yeah, I was going to so gauge know. the fish crab. You know, but, uh, I, I, I was. Yeah, we have some right there. I was there. expecting. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. hey. I like that. I was going to come up here and call Jake the dog face boy. <laughs> Just going to spare lovely. a moment for him. Yeah, it was really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, my name is Zach. Um, as somebody who's relatively young and is interested in this field, um, what are maybe some tips that you could give to uh, how you broke into it? Or, or um, My parents were in the business, which was helpful for me because I understood it early on, and they made an introduction to uh, to the news director at KTLA, who they worked for at one time. Yeah, and but that's selling yourself short. You didn't no, no, get that, that was that was That was how I broke yeah, in. That yeah. was how I broke in. Um, I think you do whatever you can do, anyone you know, walk into a newsroom, you, you find a way into that first job. Do whatever you can to get that first job. Hi, Katie and Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I've had, uh, I've had people come up to me uh, all the time, and, and we, you pass names on, and, and you I get emails. Um, and then you just work your ass off, yeah. um, and, you, and you don't take no for an answer. Um, and, you, and you build relationships, you build sources, you study it, yeah. you live and you breathe it. And you just push your way into the job that you want. I mean, like not in an in in assault sort of yeah. way, <laughs> but like in a you know professional sort of way. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more on this side? As cool. Stay here. Yeah, I was just curious uh, if you could see his uh, his winning the election early on, or were you just as surprised as, as the? Rest I wasn't of us? surprised. Um, I wasn't surprised. I, I was saying this to my friends over and over again. It, it, you know, get ready to say President Trump. And to my and to my colleagues at NBC, we'd have these morning meetings where I, I felt like that Simpsons meme, old man yells at, cl at cloud, <laughs> because I kept calling and saying, you guys, I know this Access Hollywood tape feels like a big deal here in New York, but it's not a big deal at the Trump rallies, and it's not a big deal to the cab drivers that I meet on a daily basis, or the people I meet flying on a plane, or at, at the Panera Bread, or whatever, wherever I was. And I, we would ask people every single day. So I, I, I admit, like I, I personally thought I must be an idiot. How could I possibly believe this? Maybe I'm the one that's wrong. But I, early on, he got 20,000 people at a rally in Mobile, Alabama in August of 2015. That is six months before a primary, and he was a Republican candidate. And who's somebody who uh, is a New York billionaire who hadn't been a Republican his whole New life. New York billionaire who, who, for all intents and purposes, should have had nothing to do. People should have never uh, found a, uh, a way to relate to him, yet they did. I mean, it was there early on. I remember Steve King telling me in, around that time, don't sell him short. He comes into Iowa with his helicopter, and people just throw themselves at it. So, yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so it was kind of similar along the lines of the question that was asked a couple ago. Um, you know, I'm interested in the field, and, you know, you're a female. So I was just wondering, you know, if you could speak to a little bit of what it was like, you know, kind of from a female perspective. Yeah. Being on a campaign that was, you know, kind of hostile <laughs> to females. <laughs> I will say this, and, and 
take it or leave it. I never thought of myself as a female reporting on this campaign. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Um, and, and it's credit and a testament to the way I was raised. I never thought of being the first woman to do this or that. I thought, oh, maybe I'll be president. Or, oh, I'll be a Supreme Court justice. Are you running? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was told, Donald Trump told me I could never be president. <laughs> Whatever. He was right. Um, Sad. <laughs> Always, whenever he does that, I'm, I'm sorry, I laugh whenever he does that. It's, 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 it gets me. Um, uh, so I didn't, I didn't, I, I think my, my way of protesting that uh, as a, you know, as, as a woman is just to not accept it. I'm, I'm just a reporter. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. It was yep. a pain in the ass to do my hair. <laughs> And to like, you know, find find new clothing to wear every day on the trail. That was in as much as uh, being a woman on the trail, that that to me was it sucks that I have to wake up and curl my hair every day. I, I sp Put I powder on. I, I spent months recuperating from some uh, a foot uh, foot problem. Uh, so I uh, all afternoons I was uh, watching you and uh, and I, I really appreciate it. I have a very trivial question, which I uh, OK. Uh, you're busy all day, and you wear different clothes uh, every every morning, every day. Uh, do you have any say in uh, what it is you're wearing, or is it? Yeah, is it's all my decision. It's it all my decision. Yeah. Um, I uh, you know, when I sat down at the anchor job, NBC said we should we should find you some more serious clothing, but that <laughs> was but it wasn't like we're gonna put you in a uniform. They they uh -huh. they helped me just I guess snazzy myself up, <laughs> but no, I, I choose what I wear. I wish somebody just choose, chose for me. It'd be much easier. <laughs> me, I pack it. I, I pack, I got a, what I did was I got the same J. Crew sweater in 17 different colors. <laughs> the Tibby sweater, it's really great. Um, and I just, I just rotated it. Yeah. Fashion tips with Katie Turr. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Katie. Uh, just one question. What do you think broadcast journalism will look like in, say, 20 years? With I have no idea. That is a <laughs> terribly hard question. What will broadcast like journalism Snapchat look like in 20 years? shows and, I don't know, Instagram and social media. I don't know. I, I mean, I, if I knew, I would be... I would be investing in it. <laughs> um, Snapchat's doing well. We have an, a Snapchat platform at NBC, and it's getting a lot of attention. But it's so short. I mean, it's not... You, go, you don't really dive into it. Do you think cable news will still be relevant? I, it depends on, I think it depends on the president, who we're talking about, and what's going on in politics. I hope it's still relevant. I like cable news. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. This is kind of uh, looking backwards a little bit. Um, what is your feeling about the way, in a sense, the network kind of got co-opted by Trump in a way of, he got all the free publicity. He, you know who was who was driving the news. You he know, got just billions of dollars more yeah, in publicity yeah. than anyone else. But but uh, you know the the level of int the intensity of coverage, for instance, you know, covering every one of those sixteen. Well, well, uh, primary, you look look at um, look at the crowds that turned out for each one of those candidates. Uh, Donald Trump got crowds that were much much larger, so the attention on him was more focused uh, from the voters. Even ir ir regardless, irregardless. Yeah, Jesus, I almost said that word. <laughs> I make fun of people it. for that word. Um, regardless of whether or not we were putting him on, on television more so than we were putting uh, Jeb Bush on television, uh, I know that the other candidates take strong issue with that. I think it's a fair conversation to have. I think we can do a better job of coverage in 2020. I certainly hope we do. Um, there were obviously nights where I questioned, why are we taking this rally live? I think towards the end of the campaign, we stopped doing it as much. Um, I don't make that decision. Um, I, I I would just like to see instead. I mean, we cover the candidates a lot. I'd like to see more coverage of the voters and issues that voters care about. Right, and that seemed to be the part missing in the debates. And yeah. got around to the policy question. Well, but Donald Trump something. had no policy. Yeah, <laughs> but but in terms of maybe how the how the re not the reporters but how the facilitators handled it, they didn't seem to press that much. Yeah, yeah. I think whenever policy questions were asked during the debates, and inev invariably Donald, I mean, then people asked him policy questions, and he just he just his answers were just he was talk he talked himself in circles. Um, he never really answered those questions. It's hard to get someone to answer a question when they refuse to answer it. You know this. We talk to politicians every day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi. 
Uh, during the campaign, or uh, maybe especially on election night, did you let yourself have any thoughts about what this means for America? You should read the prologue of my book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Buy the book. Read the book. <laughs> Buy the book. Read the book. No, seriously, read it. I, or read that, at least read that section, and you'll get the answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to give it away. She's got to something to surprise. <laughs> yeah. Hi. I'm just interested in your take on uh, Sean Spicer. Is he basically a decent guy that just found himself in a terrible position, or is he responsible for the way he treated the press? All you. You wrote this book, so go ahead. <laughs> I feel like you should answer this one. Um, Sean Spicer was always very nice to me on the campaign trail. Um, I had a good relationship with him. Uh, uh, he never led me astray on anything. Um, it was surprising when he, when he took the podium in the White House press briefing room and berated the press and lied. It was. I was genuinely surprised. I wondered. I wondered what in the world happened. Um, I don't know if it was a good man who just got caught up in it and got forced to do something he didn't want to do. I mean, he's an adult. He can make decisions on his own. Um, but I think what he did in that role was serious, and at times, a serious violation of what you should be doing in that position. Not you shouldn't be lying. It's not you're lying. You're not just lying to the press. You're lying to the American public. And you're being paid by the American public. And you're paying, and we pay your salary. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Susan, and I have to say, like everybody else, you're my hero. So <laughs> thank you for what you do. Thank you very much. Um, hope it's okay for me to ask two quick. Questions. I think you have to ask one because we only have time okay. after this for two more questions. Um, was there anything while you were covering Trump um, and his campaign? that you had any questions about the Russian, because now we're learning, it goes way back. We were very curious about why he was so friendly towards uh, and warm towards Vlad Vladimir Putin. Um, even very early on, this was in 2015, uh, when he bragged about being stablemates with, with Putin <laughs> on 60 Minutes, which doesn't make sense yeah. because <laughs> those interviews were done hundreds of, different thousands days. of miles apart um, at different times. Uh, about different things. <laughs> about different things. It didn't make it didn't make much sense. Um, so there were questions. It was a, there was this assumption among us that he just had businesses there and he didn't want to he didn't want to anger the person in Russia who could um, affect how successful he was in that country. Big questions. Big questions. When he said Russia hack into Hillary's email, um, as as the intelligence community um, had big questions about him then as well. Did we know that there was investigation going on? No, we had no idea. Did you sense anything from Manafort or watching? Uh, we, we, we reported on all the, the um, uh, business dealings he had with Ukraine and the questionable aspects of them during the campaign. So yeah, there, was, there were questions around Manafort's role. Okay, thank you. Of course. This, oh. this has to be the last question, I think. I think you You've got to get to a baby. You have to sign some books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot well, of books. Okay. Uh, I think it'll be quick. Uh, he clearly, Trump clearly targeted the women uh, reporters and uh, Megyn Kelly, certainly. And uh, I think he called you out more. Was that good for uh, career or bad or neutral? I mean, I'm sitting here, so I can't argue with it. Um, I think he, I think he, as much as he goes after the press, he's been very good for journalism. He's revived it, and he's revived your interest in it. So that is a very good thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. No more failing New York Times, even though he still says it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.